The British had not allowed forces from neighboring Arab countries to enter Palestine until after their departure. By May the 15th, with the last British troops gone, Arab armies entered the country from the borders of Lebanon, Egypt, and what was then called Transjordan. Their declared objective, to liberate Palestine. That day, the New York Times ran the headline, Jews in grave danger in all Muslim lands. I've come back to the United States to tell Jews in the United States how the state of Israel has been formed. The Jews are holding their ground in the country in spite of the fact that they have been outnumbered by the Arabs and the Arabs have come much better equipped with heavy arms than the Jews have in their possession. The reason is a, sim a simple one. Jews who are fighting in Palestine, the state of Israel, are fighting for the only thing that they have in their possession. It means life or death to them. The Jewish forces in 1947-48, I mean, they were far stronger, even far more numerous, actually, than uh, the combined Arab armies. Uh, they were highly prepared, uh, highly dedicated, well-armed um, fighting force, which was superior to all the Arab armies combined, except perhaps one army, which the one army which they didn't really take on, and they made a deal with, really, talking about the Jordanian army. In the fact, the Arab army that entered Palestine in the beginning did not increase the number of 24,000 people. And this is a problem. أن كل الجيوش العربية التي شاركت لم تكن لتصل إلا لثلث أعداد اليهود العسكريين المدربين المستعدين للقتال الجيوش العربية لم تكن معدة لم تكن مستعدة لم تكن منظمة لم يكن هنالك القيادة الموحدة بقيادة الملك عبد الله كانت تعمل في جانب والآخرين يعملوا في جانب آخر الجيش العراقي تلقى تعليماته من بغداد was in fact one of the most um, bitterly divided disorganized and ramshackle coalitions in the history of modern warfare. The Jordanian army was commanded by the Englishman Sir John Glubb, known as Glubb Pasha. Over 40 other British officers also served in the army and held great influence. Under British advice, King Abdullah of Transjordan agreed to a secret deal with the Jewish leaders to avoid clashes between the Jordanian army and the Jewish fighters in return for the West Bank and East Jerusalem. Such token resistance was the reason Glubb later called the 1948 war, the phony war. Glubb is a very complex character. He was not the simple-minded soldier that he pretended to be, but he was a highly sophisticated politician who imposed on the Arabs Britain's partition plan. The meeting was between Ernest Bevin, the Labour government's foreign secretary, uh, and uh, Tawfiq Abul Hoda, the Jordanian prime minister, who was accompanied by Glab Pasha, who also acted as an interpreter. Bevin asked Abul Hoda, what do you plan to do? And uh, Abul Hoda said, we plan to send the Arab Legion to protect and keep the Arab part of Palestine. And Bevin said, that seems the sensible thing to do, but do not go and invade the Jewish part. 2nd of May, they met for the last time, British officers in the Arab Legion, to find a solution for Jerusalem, but it didn't work. But what else happened in that meeting is that they brought maps which showed where the Jordanian Legion would stop and would not enter the Jewish state. And where the Jordanian Legion stopped is today the border of the West Bank. That's how the West Bank was actually created. On July the 10th, the Jordanian forces pulled out of Lod and Ramla. Clear of Jordanian forces, the two cities were bombed by what was now the Israeli Air Force. The Israeli army then moved in, commanded by Colonel Moshe Dayan. In Lod alone, over 100 Palestinians were massacred inside the Dahmash Mosque. More than 50,000 Palestinians were expelled from the two cities. 
Walking without provisions in the summer heat, many died of exhaustion in what has since become known as the Lidda Death March. Despite the presence of the Arab forces in Palestine, atrocities were still committed, yet few are well documented. Israeli historian Theodore Katz submitted a thesis claiming the Israelis had committed a massacre in the coastal village of Tantura. They closed all the four sides of Tantura, kind of a boat from the Israeli young navy that was closing the side of, of, of the seashore in order that they won't be able to run away. What I heard from one of the Jews I uh, interviewed, a soldier in the second company. He was moving with his pistol of nine millimeters on the shore among the men, asking them, where is your rifle? Those who said that my rifle is somewhere next to my house was uh, taken like this with a rope to his house by two or four people. And uh, the text was then, the rifle came out and the one did not. And those who answered there on the, on the beach, I have no rifle, were directly shot in their head. Now, this is not a Palestinian story. This is a Palestinian of a Jew that was a lawyer in the state of Israel many years the Palestinian men of Tantura were taken to the cemetery. And there, there was, uh, they were uh, told, they were put in lines and they were told to begin digging. And whenever a line finished digging, they were shot and fell down inside. <laughs> 